And money is a big part of it, a major part, I can tell you this. And until nurses in this country get paid better, we're going to have this problem. I think the more money is an important variable, but not the only one. We have to look at the National Housing Trust, perhaps providing accommodation at hospital points or close to for hospital workers. We're winding down to that point of 2021. December 10 makes exactly 21 months since the COVID infection was detected in Jamaica. Since then, more than 91,000 people have tested positive and more than 2,400 have died. The oxygen shortage, the vaccine blunders, and all a part of the COVID-19 response. And now, the real concern with lifestyle-related diseases like hypertension and diabetes worsening amid the COVID era. Hello and thank you for joining us for this Editor's Forum of The Gleaner. I'm Damian Mitchell. Today, the COVID review and the prospects for Jamaica's health systems amid the expectations of a fourth wave. We're grateful to have today the Health Minister, Dr. Christopher Tufton, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jacqueline Vesesa mckenzie We also have Medical Doctor Michael Abrahams and the Chairman of the National Health Fund, Mr. Howard Mitchell. For this segment, we'll allot each of the panelists one minute to make an opening statement, which really is an assessment of the COVID response over the past 21 months. Uh, Dr. Abrahams, may I begin with you? In all my years as a physician, this has been the most divisive, controversial issue we've had to deal with in terms of health, unfortunately. And go going forward, it's, it's obvious that we're going to need a, a multi-pronged approach to manage COVID-19. It's going to have to be a multi-pronged approach, a consultative approach, and hopefully we can have some kind of consensus as to how best to deal with this. Um, the most appropriate analogy I've seen <clears throat> regarding management of COVID-19 is that it's like building the airplane while you're flying it. So as you're going along, you're learning things and things will change. So I think this demands a lot of humility and honesty. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abrams. Dr. Tufton, your one minute, sir. I think that your run up to the wicket ignored some very important positives, and I'd like to recognize them on behalf of the thousands of healthcare workers. We have been able to go through three significant waves. We have provided hospitalization, ventilation, support, contact tracing. Thousands of healthcare and frontline workers have done their utmost best, I believe, and they should be commended for that. They're suffering fatigue now, but they have given of themselves, I think, very significantly despite the limited resources. I also want to say I think we have collaborated, but it has evolved. It never started that way. Uh, there were times when we made some missteps, but there's no playbook for COVID. But I do believe that Jamaica is safer for the efforts that have taken place. And I do believe we're in a better place now with the plans ahead to make a more resilient health system. And I'm looking forward, frankly speaking, for us coming out of COVID in a way that will make us stronger. So I, I look forward for the conversation and I look forward to the increased collaboration. Let's invite then uh, Mr. Howard Mitchell, the chairman of the National Health Fund for your one minute or 60 seconds, sir, you can choose. Thank you, Damien, and thank you for having me here. Good, e good afternoon, everybody. Well, the NHF, from the NHF's perspective, the additional burden was to source and procure vaccines. And um, the early days were difficult, but I think the lesson that we have picked up at the NHF and that I think the people of Jamaica should, should hear and, and, and digest is that going forward, public health must become more significant and important in not only the government's policy making, but in the lives of ordinary people. We need to be much more focused on the care of ourselves. Because, as a, for instance, COVID is really a disease of the unhealthy. If you are healthy, your likelihood, vaccinated or not, your likelihood of dying from COVID is much less. And I think public health must become a more significant foundation stone in planning and in strategic implementation of government policy. Thank you very much. Dr. Bissis. He forgot to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Bissis, Dr. McKenzie, uh, year one. <clears throat> yes, I think that um, Jamaica has learned a lot 
um, over the last two years. I think that the Ministry of Health has um, worked very hard in trying to manage this pandemic. And I think that we have seen the strengths of our health system. From the very start, we use the five prongs of our pandemic plan, which is coordination, um, which we have built on significantly, um, surveillance and monitoring. That has really done a lot of work. Prevention and containment. We've never had to contain a disease like we've had to contain this disease, and we've learned a lot over the last two years. Health system strengthening is our fourth prong. We've done a lot of work where that is concerned that will put us in a better place in case we have other pandemics to deal with. And communication, um, which is the final prong, which we have, has been a, a very good tool that we've had straight from February last year when we've started to manage this problem. So I, I think that, um, Going forward, we have we continue to strengthen in these areas, and I think that we have done well so far. Well, let me continue on that because Mr. Mitchell essentially threw out the challenge a while ago when he said that uh, COVID really is a disease of the unhealthy, and public health must play a more important role. We're now 21 months in with COVID in Jamaica. What changes can we expect in relation to your imp your, your focus on public health as an important pillar? in the, the fight of this disease? Well, in terms of, um, well, let us look at where our strengths were and where our weaknesses were. Our big strengths were in terms of our primary care system, okay? Uh, and we would have seen that in terms of our health, our community workers. We would have seen that in terms of how our, our health centers are structured and how our health departments are structured to deal with emergencies like this. Going forward, in terms of building on this and building on the primary care system, that is a big focus of the ministry and has been reflected here today in terms of our health system strengthening program and our, our role going forward in the next few months in terms of building out the primary care reform. So strengthening of our primary care system, building on what we have, that's how we go forward. And in, in plain terms, what can we expect in, in, in relation to building out of this primary health system? Okay, so well, in, one, two, three. Uh, well, in terms of our, our health centers, we are looking at develop, uh, of, um, delivering a more comprehensive care and quality care in terms of um, our upgrading to community district and comprehensive health centers where now we have 325 primary health care facilities, but only a small percentage of those are offering services regularly, 24 hours a day. Well, not 24 hours a day, sorry. Um, four, um, eight hours for the day, um, five days for the week. And so we're going to build out on that in terms of having the service more readily available. But we're also building out in terms of our electronic health systems, in terms of our surveillance, to strengthen our surveillance, making it easier for reporting of especially the class one diseases, to so make it easier for us to analyze what is happening in the field. Yes. And in terms of the weaknesses, you spoke about the strengths in terms of the weaknesses. In terms of weaknesses, um, what in our secondary care facilities, our ability to manage surges was a big issue that we had. If we had more patients, how do we manage them? COVID over the last 21 months has shown us how it is that we manage them um, and how it is that we manage patients, not just in a hospital system, but in the development of um, other kind of facilities, step down facilities. So that's something that we need to build out on. We've never had before a surge capacity plan. Mm -hmm. And I think over the last 21 months, we have seen that. So even if we're planning now into going to into a fourth surge, we know exactly how we activate depending on how many patients we're we'll seeing. We'll come back to that issue of preparing for the fourth surge, but I want to bring in back uh, Mr. Mitchell here because the point you raised about public health and the fact that it <clears throat> must be seen as more important suggests that there are weaknesses that you have also noticed. What are those weaknesses you have noticed in respect of public health and the approach? First of all, I think that in terms of planning for public health, we, we perhaps only see it in a narrow context. The minister has, and the ministry recently certainly, has broadened the idea of, for, with, with non-communicable diseases, of, has broadened the idea of people taking care of their own health, right? But public health also involves things like uh, violent behavior, 
okay? It involves, it involves aberrant behavior. Those are things that we need to broaden the scope of our planning for public health to accommodate. Weaknesses, you know, I, I think that everybody in Jamaica likes to feel that we, we all should be able to get the best medical care ever, right? You hear of centers of excellence. Well, my personal opinion is that what we need to focus on is getting as many people as possible, the majority of the population, good basic health care and minimizing the occurrences that we need to have expensive equipment and an expensive treatment because this is a poor country. One of the weaknesses I've heard, uh, certainly Dr. Michael Abraham's uh, trumpeting, is the issue of the vaccine hesitancy and the response of the government to the vaccine hesitancy. But let me ask you though, Dr. Abrahams, are there genuine reasons for the hesitancy outside of what we'd have heard from the official dome? The, the vaccine hesitant, um, they're not really a monolithic group at all. You know, there is, it's a wide variation in reasons from, this, from strange reasons such as um, a lady told me recently she's not taking the vaccine because when she had her second child at Jubilee and she had a cesarean section and got injections, they affected her. So you have things like that, fear of need needles and, and reasons that may not be fully rational, to very, very, very rational concerns. For example, many people are concerned about possible long-term effects of the vaccines. These vaccines are not the same as the ones you've been using before for things like polio and measles. The principle is the same, but the technology is a bit different. The technology is not new. It's been around for quite a while, so that's true. But the vaccines themselves have not been in general use for a long time. And has the response of the ministry been sufficient to meet these sort of uh, views by some of these people? It's hard to really tell because there's a push to get everyone vaccinated, that is true. But information about potential side effects could be stronger because, as I said before, if, if something has not been around that long, you cannot tell what the long-term effects are. So, for example, it has been documented that after vaccination, some women have disruptions of their menstrual cycles. That's, docu that's well documented. As a matter of fact, even some postmenopausal women who stopped seeing periods years ago have had bleeding episodes following vaccination. That's well documented. So when a woman says to me, you know, I'm in my late 30s, I've had fertility issues, and I hear that this thing can affect my menstrual cycle, I'm worried about my fertility. I'm worried about the long-term consequences of that. And that's a genuine, that's a genuine rational concern. Another concern is that, for example, it has been shown by many, 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 many studies that natural immunity, in other words, after you've contracted COVID, you will have a, an immune response that will protect you for a certain duration of time. There are many people who have had COVID. There are, there are many people among the unvaccinated who had COVID. And they're telling me that, well, if I had COVID and I had an immune response a, a month or so ago, why should I rush to take the vaccine? Yes. And many people are hesitant, will tell you, I am not anti-vaccine. I have hesitancy regarding these particular vaccines. And that's one of the problems. And that's a big headache for you, Dr. Tufton, in response to this vaccine hesitancy. And clearly, the huge amount of money we're literally pouring down the drain by procuring vaccines that people are not taking up. What's the plan in respect of this vaccine hesitancy? So I think the program around vaccination has evolved. It has evolved from having shortages, as said earlier by Mr. Mitchell, to having abundance of supplies, to having outlet issues, to having more than enough outlets. Um, and that is evolving into now home delivery and community activation. We are now going to be deploying more mobile units. For example, there are six additional units that are coming on stream shortly. We have public health nurses literally doing house to house. We have call-in sessions where persons who are immobile can call their parish public health office and schedule visits for vaccination. And of course, by engaging non-public health officials, private doctors or um, pharmacies or others, we're hoping that the one-on-one -on -one messaging can overcome some of the very objections that Dr. Abraham spoke to. In the indication that this is working? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a trickle. It, it's, it's, it's incremental, I should say. 
meaning you're not having a rush except for extraordinary circumstances. For example, uh, the overseas work program. If you get through to go abroad to do farm work, you need a vaccine, there's a rush to get the vaccine. So when you have those compelling reasons that are linked to economics or otherwise, you get that. Otherwise, it's really about convincing persons. And I believe the evolving situation of vaccinate for access, meaning you know whether it is for weddings or events, the announcement by the Prime Minister of 50 congregating, but vaccination only within the public space, I think will also add to the incentivization. But we do have a lot of work to do because the anti-vax movement is real, and some of those fears are real also, and we have to continue to confront them. Have well. they won the war? You know, I think the anti-vax movement has become a lot more powerful and have been underestimated, not just by our local authorities, but by our multilateral partners, our international agencies. Um, over time, immunization as a concept has been universal and a critical part of our human development here in Jamaica and the world. But over time also, the anti-vax movement have been well resourced and use alternative media. And I think one of the lessons coming out of this is going to have to be a significant pushback to show the virtues of immunization generally. And in this instance, vaccination to combat COVID, which I think is still the best option. So in other words, they have won round one, no, but we don't accept, round two. Well, if you want to put it in that way, in some jurisdictions, I believe the anti-vax and the noise in the larger media scape has created some fears. But I do believe that for the most part, um, most people recognize the importance of vaccination and we have to continue to push. Mr. Mitchell, you are in charge of helping to procure vaccines for Jamaica. Are you now considering reducing the number of vaccines you're seeking to have imported into this country? Well, the NHF is a creature of instruction. So we don't decide on how many vaccines that the country wants. We are told, get, you know, facilitate this, get this done. I, I have no instructions to reduce the vaccines that we have booked for delivery. Which is? Okay. How many? Um, at the moment, it is what is left um, on our order chart, if you want, is approximately one and a half million doses of Johnson vaccines. Um, and potentially um, another 300,000 doses of Pfizer vaccines. That can be, a, 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 a trans, it can be changed because we actually can shift the brand in one of those circumstances. In the Johnson order, we could shift the brand if we receive those instructions. Uh, At the moment, we have not. Dr. Bissiza McKenzie, can I bring you in here though as the clinician, given the pattern of behavior we've seen with, with regard to the take-up of vaccine, should we not be looking at rescoping, re looking at the orders, and in essentially trying to save so many uh, doses from being dumped? Yes, that is something that we certainly have been looking at. And you notice that Mr. Mitchell has not spoken about any AstraZeneca coming in because we have seen a decrease in the take up of AstraZeneca. And so we have orders, um, we have quite a number of vaccines in country. What we are looking at in projection into the future is looking at um, reduced doses of AstraZeneca, trying to ensure that we have the second doses for persons who have gotten their first doses. So for Pfizer, we have seen that we've had, even though the take up now is lower, but um, it is better. And so therefore we're looking more, and as Mr. Mitchell has, has also said, that we are swapping out some of the, um, the vaccines that we would have had on order to try to get the replacement with the mRNA vaccines that are, we're seeing a better take up. In terms of the Johnson & Johnson, we've had, we have several of those um, on order. We had anticipated that the one dose vaccine would have been attractive. Um, we're not seeing the kind of take up that we had expected. So we're trying to swap out those as well. So, so by yes. when will you know that you're cutting down the numbers on order? Well, we have, we have started to cut down in terms of the different brands. Um, so we're not placing any new orders 
of AstraZeneca in large amounts, except to deal with our, the pattern that we're seeing and to, to ensure that we have the second doses that are, that are in line. There are so many other issues we have to speak about, including the cost. And I'm sure Mr. Mitchell may have an idea as to the cost that has been incurred and those that have really just gone down the drain literally. What, what are we talking about in respect of cost in of vaccines? Of overall figure, um, at this point in time, the, the, the raw cost of acquisition, because I don't have in my head the cost of the logistics, but the raw cost of the acquisition would be in the region of 15 million US dollars. Right. Uh, uh, um, that's not for what we have, that's a total for what we have on order as well as what we have. I need to bring in Kimon Francis, who has a question at this point. Uh, Kimon, can you go ahead with your question and then we can come right back here. The sign up from vaccine from China. The ministry spent uh, to get an additional 100,000 doses. How much was paid for it? And uh, why did we acquire this given the level of hesitancy that we have with uh, the vaccine? Okay, so I can't give you a price. I'll defer that to maybe Mr. Mitchell. But why did we get the Sinopharm vaccines? Well, first of all, we got 100,000 as a grant and 100,000 was purchased. Uh, the general principle of acquiring alternative brands is to provide the options that Jamaicans have for particular brands. <coughs> uh, to be honest with you, it's not an ideal strategy, ideally you should really encourage Americans to take the first vaccine they get once it is clinically tried and proven to be authentic. Um, and uh, however, we do recognize that a feature of the vaccine program here in Jamaica is the influence of you know, external sources, people doing their own research, and in the interest of trying to maximize take up, we had the opportunity to, and we, we acquired a, a quantity of the, that particular brand. Dr. Tufton, I know you have to leave quite shortly, but let me look at the issue of the infrastructure with the current health system, which is a huge problem. I know currently that there are several hospitals, University Hospital of the West Indies, Kingston Public Hospital, and Mandeville Regional, without critical diagnostic uh, machines. What is the plan once and for all, at least at, the, at, at these uh, primary, at secondary level, I beg your pardon. So let me just say that we have a plan for healthcare. COVID has taught us many lessons. And what is very uh, fortunate for us is that there was some vision put into a 10-year development plan before COVID. COVID delayed some of the implementation, but we continued to work even while COVID dominated the space. We, that 10-year strategic plan looks at three critical things. Hospital or health center build out infrastructure build out and there are several uh, to the tune of about 200 million us over the next three years then you have diagnostic equipment and an assessment was done to determine where the shortages are in the meantime we have been outsourcing under a special program to private players we're looking at things like leasing versus purchase maintenance arrangement and we'll make some specific announcement around that in keeping with that 10-year plan. All this seems long-term, though, it's medium not, to long-term. For, for the man who is coming from yeah. Mylgali in Manchester to Kingston to get a, a scan done. The man is coming from Manchester to Kingston doesn't necessarily have to anymore because last year we spent one billion Jamaican dollars contracting private diagnostic services in every parish so that when a hospital requires a diagnostic test and the equipment is either down or absent, they are sent to that private provider. That is a temporary solution, but it is an immediate solution. The same, the third component is the people, and the CMO has been working on a human resource plan for the next 10 years to right size, having built out and provide the infrastructure. So I am very proud of the work that has been done by the team. I am very proud of the government's commitment uh, which I think is very necessary for building out that infrastructure. And the partners that we have worked with, the IDB, for example, 50 million US dollars, the EU, 10 million euros, and of course, GOJ's own commitment. Uh, what we are witnessing, finally, is the largest infrastructure investment that Jamaica would have seen in, in health since independence. And I think that says a lot about the future 
And I think COVID has reinforced why this is so important. Except though that you spoke about human resources but never dwelled on it. And CMO, probably this is where you may come in. That issue of human resource more and more is becoming a critical matter because we're not retaining our doctors and nurses. What's the plan? Well, in terms of um, the retaining of the doctors and um, other healthcare workers, we're looking at, first of all, to get the approval for an overall plan for secondary care and primary care um, so that it's not a matter of asking for approval in a, in a very um, haphazard position so that the Minister of Finance would have an overall picture of what it is that it will take for us to provide secondary care services as well as primary care services. So that's our first um, goal, to finish that plan so that we would have that picture, overall picture, and then we see incrementally how it is that we achieve that. Without even having that study, one of the things they want is more money. Uh, is, that, is, is, that, is that possible? <laughs> you won't be able to answer, but certainly Dr. Tufton should be. That's one of the things they want, Doc, more yes. money to stay. Is there is a reclassification? Well, uh, can I tell you, I think the more money is an important variable, but not the only one. Mm -hmm. My own research has shown that healthcare professionals require security of tenure, and we have reclassified several thousand healthcare positions, primarily in nursing, over the last three years to give them permanent status as opposed to contract labor. The second is working environment. You've heard of the infrastructure development. And the third is remuneration. And remuneration is an issue. Um, there's no doubt that they deserve more. Of course, that has to be reconciled with the public system and the Ministry of Finance, and by extension, the cabinet negotiates these positions, which is now taking place for a number of, of these workers. Um, but I believe that we have to look at it as a package. And I think that as much as we try to give as much as possible in salaries, we're also making a, a valiant effort to improve the working conditions mm -hmm. and to provide the security of tenure, which I think as a package will, will, will incentivize and, and hopefully uh, cause some of, many of them to stay here rather than migrate. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say in terms of the improvement in the environment in which you work, I think that's a very that's a critical area um, for all healthcare providers. Um, they they want to work in an environment that they feel you know is um, it, it, it stimulates them to work as well as provide adequate care for the patient that they're dealing with. And this is part of what this project is about: the health system strengthening program to ensure that our facilities are built to purpose and not that we expand as something new comes up. So in terms of looking at the secondary care system, what we're looking at is the classification of the hospitals, the upgrading of the type C hospitals, the type B hospitals, and the regional hospitals to ensure that they all offer a standard of care. And what we're doing, for example, in this project at St. Anne's Bay Hospital and Spanish Stone Hospital is to ensure that all the facilities that are needed to provide the services are being put, in, put there. And the same thing for the health centers not just in terms of the facilities, but also in terms of the kind of mentoring that the doctors need and provision for continued medical education. Because many of the doctors feel abandoned when they go to work in a health center. There is no continued education. There is no opportunity for dialogue. And so we're looking at creating posts for specialists in the primary care system that would increase the service, but also provide that mentoring for the young doctors. And we're also using, have rolled out our tele-echo in this project that is improving how it is that doctors get information. And also with the other tele, telehealth me measures that we're putting in place, it's just to increase the communication, just to create that environment so that yes, the money is, is a lot, but other things that would make you want to work within the public system, we're working to improve that. Still with you though, Dr. Bessesa McKenzie, it has been a terrible year for accidents and gunshot injuries, flooding the hospitals, uh, which simply means that your staff is coming under greater stress. And then we have the issue of motor vehicle crashes. Uh, what is the plan should this worsen? Right now we are seeing those increasing numbers already. And uh, it is, it is usually, you know, um, the hospitals are able to cope in terms of um, bringing on additional um, hours sometimes in terms of work. 
Um, but the additional plans in terms of beds capacity, we don't have uh, much demand usually to go beyond what we presently have. But fortunately, we would have increased the number of beds in some of our facilities, so we would be able to accommodate that. Um, in terms of the, the staff, it is a time of year when the staff tend to come under a lot of pressure, especially in the operating theaters. Uh, we don't have <laughs> um, much room for improving the human resources at this time, and so we normally bring on persons to do sessional work and we usually have take up, but it is understandable that persons are tired. It is, it is a difficult time when the numbers increase, you know, and it does take a lot of extra work to get through this period. I know Dr. Abrams has an intervention he wants mm -hmm. to make, but let's go a little bit beyond that. So what if this rate continues <coughs> into next year and probably into the other year with gunshot injuries flooding in your hospitals, uh, injuries coming as a result of crashes? These are not short-term um, fixes, you know, and some of the infrastructure that we are putting in will help to deal with these problems. So, for example, at St. Anne's Bay Hospi Regional Hospital, what is being planned in this project is an in, uh, ICU that we're putting in because we know that there is a demand, especially with the number of crashes that occur on the North Coast highways. And so we tend to usually get a lot of transfers in for head injuries into Kingston and St. Andrew. So with the intensive care unit, the expansion of that, both the ICU beds and high dependency beds, we would be able to cope better with that. And also with the putting in of um, radiological services for CT and MRI at that hospital, that would also improve their capacity to manage. There is going to be an expansion also of their emergency department in that we're taking out the outpatient department out of the present accident and emergency department, which would give them more space to, to be able to deal with the increased load of patients. So it's not an over, there are no immediate fix when it comes to those kind of infrastructure, but certainly the plans are there. For Spanish Stone Hospital, what we're putting in are new operating theaters, five new, I think it's five or six new operating theaters that would help them to be able to better manage um, in terms of their caseload. But then we're also putting in additional 100 beds there that would also um, assist with the surgical capacity because these are supposed to be surgical beds. And we're putting in an ICU and HDU within that facility, expanding their radiological services to also include um, CT and MRI and their lab services as well. So that also will, will assist in the management of these, of these problems. Very well. Let me ask uh, Dr. Abrams to comment here. You were indicating you had something you want to add earlier. I just wanted to say something about the nursing issue because there are different reasons why nurses may leave, but, but money is a major factor, I can tell you this. I, I, I graduated from med school in 89. I'm old. And <coughs> I remember when I was doing internship, the first month I was going to the bank on, on campus at UWE, and I gave a nurse a lift, and we were talking, and she told me what her paycheck was, and I, th I thought she was joking, literally. I really thought she was joking, and when she showed it to me, I was horrified. That was 89. It's still not good. Many nurses can't even afford to buy a car to, to, to transport themselves. So many are still using tra public transport. Uh, and, and the one who got assaulted the other day after being dropped off by a bus, from a bus. Nurses very often have to do other things apart from just nursing duties, like lifting patients, transporting patients. And money is a big part of it, a major part, I can tell you this. And until nurses in this country get paid better, we're going to have this problem. And it affects the whole health sector because when you have an experienced nurse working in a hospital and she's used, she has the experience and she's used to that space and then she leaves and then new people come, you have to start training them again. They don't have the experience, they don't know the place and it affects patient care, both in the public and the private sector. Howard Mitchell, what's the fix? That shouldn't be addressed to the minister, but nevertheless, the fix is this, as he rightly said, and, and drawing on my experience, uh, the fix is not <coughs> just about more money because we can never compete with the established global markets that, that Jamaicans can easily access. But the fix also has to look at a holistic placement of public health in a more important way than it currently is. So that 
for instance, I was chairman of the National Housing Trust at one stage. We have to look at the National Housing Trust, perhaps providing accommodation at hospital points or close to for hospital workers, nurses, doctors, and, 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 and some ancillary staff, so that it takes the burden of transportation off of them, transportation and security. Yeah. We have to look at recognizing that the public health worker, along with the security workers, along with all the more important, the people who, who are more critical at the point of first, first delivery, get access perhaps on an easier basis to some of the benefits. Are you not setting up the NHT for more criticisms if you're going to be picking? No, well, what I've been trying to set up the NHT for, for years is a, is a re-examination of its purpose, right? And that's what we need to do. We need to take an honest look at the National Housing Trust after 45 years and say, what's the purpose, right? So I'm just saying that accommodation is housing. Okay, and that there are people who will never want to own a home, but who need a break. Mm -hmm. And there are people who need, who, if they get a break in their employment, the nurses and doctors and, and so rest of, can save some money towards buying a house eventually when they perhaps shift from that critical point. Okay, so it's, I'm just, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that public health, it's clear to me personally that public health encompasses more than just being at the end process of a crisis. It involves antisocial behaviors that cause car accidents. It involves antisocial behaviors that cause domestic violence. It, behold, it in, involves mental therapy. And those are what we have to do as a state, as a society, and as a people, is re-examine how we place public health within our priority order. Very well. Well, that's all the time we have for today's Editors Forum. The COVID review, thanks to the Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. Christopher Tufton. Thanks also to the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jacqueline Besesa mckenzie Medical Doctor Michael Abrahams, and the Chairman of the National Health Fund, Mr. Howard Mitchell. I'm Damian Mitchell. Thanks for watching.